I suppose you can never say never with the multiverse, but some of these actors have really said toodaloo to the MCU. Here's a very complicated one to kick today off with, and technically a two for one, playing hot potato with Fandral. So Josh Dallas originally played Thor's loyal friend and battle buddy in the first movie, but for the sequels we got Zachary Levi, which was very long before he was Shazam in the DCU. And like I think it goes without saying that Shazam was definitely a much better career move. In theory, we're not going to talk about what Zachary Levi is up to today. Scheduling conflicts were at the root of this recasting from the very beginning. Originally, Zachary Levi was offered the role, but he was kind of locked into Chuck at the time, so it left the role open for Dallas. But then he got into Once Upon a Time, and it was filming for another season, and seeing as Josh Dallas was kind of a starring role as Prince Charming, he couldn't exactly duck out for a season. Fandra wasn't established as an influential Marvel sidekick, so he was easy to be recast, and then he got killed off in Ragnarok. While some recastings did make a difference in a character's progression, this one didn't, and I don't think either of these guys are ever going to return to the MCU. Even the most dedicated Marvel fans may not have noticed that Red Skull was not played by the same person from Captain America the First Avenger to Avengers Infinity War. This one actually threw me, because Cap is probably my favorite of the MCU story and the movie lines. Seeing as Red Skull kind of aged a lot between his first appearance and relies heavily on CGI and prosthetics for it, it's easy for this role to be subtly recast. So Hugo Weaving will not be returning to the MCU. Ross Marquand would play Red Skull going forward. Weaving openly spoke about how he enjoyed the role, but he didn't want to wait too long between films for his character to reappear. So we got a contract negotiation and then there was a recasting. And while the change was subtle, there are differences between the character's voices and portrayals. I actually had to go back and listen and you can hear it if you really pay attention. Kind of like how Sterling Holloway and Jim Cummings both play Winnie the Pooh very similarly, but also have their own very specific character quirks. Mainframe was a minor character who first appeared in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and appearing as a disembodied head, they were originally voiced by actress and pop star Miley Cyrus, who was just inducted as a Disney legend this past weekend for all of her work with the company, rightfully deserved, but sadly, she did not reprise the role in the 2023 sequel, and I don't think she ever will again. In Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Mainframe returns with a slightly different voice because, well, Miley Cyrus wasn't available. So we got incredible actress Tara Strong, who also voices Miss Minutes in Loki. Mainframe only has a handful of lines in this film, and Strong's talent as a voice actor makes the recast nearly unnoticeable. You really gotta give it to her, she is a great voice chameleon. If you don't believe me, look at how long her IMDb is and then try again. So this is a situation I've talked about before, but obviously we gotta talk about Ed Norton. The Incredible Hulk was released shortly after Iron Man, but really didn't get any kind of positive response in comparison. It was mostly a very underwhelming affair, and it's really a black sheep in the Marvel Studios family. You don't really reference it, you don't really think about it. Some people have just sort of written it off as being an MCU movie and just being a Marvel movie. So Ed Norton had a reputation for being difficult, and after taking American History X away from Tony Kay, he tried to do the same thing with Louis Leterrier's vision for The Incredible Hulk. Now, originally they did allow Ed Norton to arrive on set really late, or write whatever was being working on, but then Ed became incensed when his contributions didn't really shine through when the movie was being edited. So, as a result, he refused to promote the finished cut and departed the role soon afterwards, which at the time was a PR nightmare. The director was somewhat supportive of Norton's plans, but he was also kind of stuck in the middle, and he's also probably never going to return to Marvel Studios. The casting of Christopher Eccleston in Anything is usually a great idea, but when he took on the role of Malekith in Thor The Dark World, it wasn't the brightest moment in his filmography. Okay, I don't think this movie is going to be on anybody's highlight reels, but let's put some respect on the name of the Ninth Doctor. So. Really, Christopher made this seem like it was just a chore. And yeah, sure, the script he was working with wasn't great, it kind of hindered his typically great range, but the villain was still kind of wasted. There was certainly nothing in the script or performance that demonstrated the dangerousness of the character, the need to eliminate the world. And the MCU kind of wasted another villain, and Christopher is not going to come back for that reason. Iron Man 2 was another disappointing effort from Marvel in its early days, with so much time devoted to setting up the Avengers, and then you got Tony Stark doing his own thing. Now, Justin Hammer, thank you Sam Rockwell, did entertain us, but Whiplash. What on earth? Mickey Rourke claimed he spent months researching the role. He's like, I haven't spent time behind bars to get into the character's mindset. He argued that what ended up on the screen was one dimensional because most of his performance was cut. He's like, if they want to make mindless comic book movies, then I don't want to be a part of that. Well, um, did Marvel really cut his role down? 
because if what ended in the film was the best of it, I'd hate to see the worst because Whiplash was kind of a low light of the whole film. And honestly, pretty forgettable. It's a reminder that a hero is really only as good as their opponent, and when the opponent sucks, the hero is kind of useless. Also, Mickey's never coming back. Dave Bautista seems to have one eye on his Marvel exit. So he starred in like a lot of Marvel movies, and also Disney Plus specials, we've gotten Drax the Destroyer a lot. And while doing media for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, he was like, I think this is gonna be the end. He told us in an interview to IGN that like, I'm good. He also added any now deleted tweet, like Drax isn't going anywhere, he just won't be played by this dude. He's like, by the time G3 came out, I'll be 54 years old. He's like, yeah, I'm expecting everything to start sagging any second now. Sure, I doubt it, but still. Also director James Gunn was like, yeah, this will be Drax's last movie, the end of the story for this group of Guardians. Now Batista said on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon that like, look, it's the perfect exit for his character. He said we all had those perfect character arcs and such a storybook ending, and he constantly relates it to the way he ended his wrestling career. He ended it on a storybook note, and he would never go back and tarnish that. He said, with Drax, I just got to end the perfect way, and I would never sign up for another job as Drax just to get a paycheck. I would tarnish that, and I won't do it. Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow was somebody who was sacrificed in Endgame, and even though she did reprise a role in a solo movie set before the events of her character's death, when asked by news outlets if she would ever return as a super spy, she said, I have no plans to return as Natasha. I feel really satisfied with this film, and it feels like a great way to go out for this chapter of my Marvel identity. Michael Douglas is the latest Marvel actor to talk about exiting the cinematic franchise. The two-time Oscar-winning actor has been playing Hank Pym since the first movie back in 2015. So almost nine years at this point. And at the premiere of the latest sequel, which was Quantum Mania, it tried. Douglas told The Hollywood Reporter that he would only return for another Marvel movie as long as I could die. It seems like he has his eye on maybe leaving the franchise, which would make sense for his character. His journey was kind of completed in the second Ant-Man movie. He found his wife, he had a good relationship with his daughter, and in Quantum Media, he felt like more of a comedic side character compared to his previous appearances, in which he was the mastermind behind the whole Ant-Man hero team. It would kind of make sense for him to retire and, you know, leave the superhero work to his daughter, maybe his son-in-law, and just, oh right, his granddaughter. Just take his time. And we shall end today with the elephant in the room, Jonathan Majors. Marvel Studios officially parted ways with the actor cast to play Kang, the central antagonist in the multiverse saga, or former central antagonist. It was after he was convicted back in December of two misdemeanor counts of harassment and harm of his ex-girlfriend. He was then arrested in March. Yeah, there was a lot of accusations flying around, a lot of not good stuff. His ex-girlfriend alleged that he forcefully retrieved something from her. He caused an excruciating injury to her body. And also when she tried to exit the situation, he did a lot of damage. So this character was supposed to be the new Thanos, the overarching big bad. And with how the MCU plans out everything for the future, the entirety of the franchise was looking a little dicey afterwards. Thankfully, we have gotten a lot of announcements in the last couple of weeks and the last month. So now we've got a good idea with the whole Doctor Doom, but still, Jonathan Majors, never again. Well, that's all for today, folks. I've been Alexa. See ya.